Luke, this is uh, Mariano Anaya, he, he's going to take talk us about clean code in Python. Let let hear a big applause. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, let's talk about clean code in Python um, software quality in a favorite programming language. First, a bit about me. Uh, my name is Mariano. I work at Anapsis as a software developer. I'm interested in open source technology, um, software architecture, and high level design, uh, Linux, and Python, of course. Uh, feel free to contact me or reach me by any of these means if you're interested in talking about uh, some of these concepts after the talk. So, uh, before we start uh, with definitions, I'd like to uh, make a, a few comments first. Uh, the code in the slides is written in Python 3, but there, sh there should be any problem, uh, no problem at all if you're using an another version of Python. So don't worry about that. Um, second, what I'm about to tell is, uh, is not uh, by no means something strict or rigid or that uh, you, you must implement. Instead, there are uh, some ideas or guidelines. Uh, some of them are opinions, so you might think uh, otherwise, and that's perfectly OK. So um, in concordance to that, we can say that uh, there's no a sole definition of clean code. There are, and instead, you will find as many definitions as developers and authors available out there. So let's try this one, which says that clean code is uh, one in which every function does pretty much what you would expect. And that uh, you can call it beautiful code when it also makes it look like the language was made for the problem. And the reason why I picked this quote is because precisely because of that last statement, because that's what we call Pythonic code, or code that is idiomatic in Python. Uh, and we'll see examples of that and how we can achieve that. So to have a common ground of understanding, we can say that clean code is focused, which means it does one thing well. And that thing that it's doing, it should be pretty much what you would expect. So the code should not, not be misleading or error prone or uh, confusing. Instead, it should be clear. And this is important for many reasons, because arguably, the quality of the code will determine the quality of the software. We all know there's a strong correlation between uh, a poor code base and a software that has a lot of errors and it's hard to maintain. Whereas the opposite is also true. If you can uh, maintain your code uh, clean, readable, and understandable, it would be much uh, less likely that there are errors and problems in the code. And if there are, they will be easier to spot. So readability counts, as we know from a set of Python. And it, it makes uh, total sense, because if you think about it, as developers, we spend much more time reading code than actually writing code. Whenever we want to make a change or add a new feature, we first have to read all the surroundings of the code we're going to modify or extend. And the extent to which you can read the code and actually tell what it's doing is uh, what ultimately will uh, determine or define how fast can we ship new changes in the code or new features. So it's related to agile development. We all know that previous messes it locks you down and deprives you from shipping new functionality uh, faster. And last, we can mention that the code is like a blueprint. It's like another model that you have where you should represent the business logic and the requirements of what you try to do. Uh, so it has to be readable, so it's useful. On the other hand, we have some uh, scenarios we are exactly the opposite to what we want. For example, complex, obfuscated code, code that is misleading or that has misdirections. Duplicated code is like the worst thing we can have in the project. And code that is not intentional revealing and that instead of uh, revealing the business logic or the business uh, requirement is exposing implementation details which should, should be uh, encapsulated or abstracted. And this also is, is all part of technical debt. There are many ways of technical debt. But having a poor code base is arguably one of the worst. And to make things worse, uh, technical debt is also invisible. It's not only negative for the project, but it's something that is sometimes hard to spot or identify. So let's try to see some examples of this uh, with uh, Python code. Um, the very first example is something really uh, simple, which is speaking about me in the code. Let's consider this function that, given a year, it should print one line per uh, day of the year. Uh, you think that it works, and it actually does work. It does what it tries to do. But now, suppose like um, I don't know, six months, a year elapsed since it first you first wrote it, and you find yourself uh, trying to figure out what it's trying to achieve or trying to do. And you see that it's trying to uh, do some calculations and see if the year is, divi is divisible by some numbers, and you cannot actually spot what it's trying to achieve. But you find that if that condition is met, it's added an extra day. So you say, OK, maybe that's trying to figure out if the year is sleep or not. But that's the problem. The fact that you have to guess is the problem. You shouldn't be guessing. 
the, the, the code should actually be telling you what it tries to achieve. So if I had to know, if I want to know if a year is sleep or not, I'd rather have a function, let's call it is sleep given a year. So I can read the code and I can actually replace that anonymous statement or something meaningful in the code. This is a very simple yet powerful thing you can do in order to uh, increase the reliability of your code uh, because it's not about like, reusing code, it's about separating concerns, differ uh, differentiating different problems into different layers and having an organization in the, in the project. Remember that functions are the first line of organization in any project. Functions should do one thing, one thing only, and do it well. And starting from this very simple example, we can say that uh, it's actually related to code duplication because if you think about it, most of the times, uh, code is uh, duplicated because it didn't have a proper abstraction or a name for it. So you might say, okay, let's say we have a validation in some part of the code, and we say, okay, I need to add a similar validation. So someone might say, okay, let's copy this line from here to here, paste it here, let's change this number, the one by the two, I'm all set. But actually not quite right because maybe uh, you introduce uh, some duplication in the code inadvertently. And the reason why that happened is because it didn't have a name, it didn't have a proper abstraction. Um, we all know that we want to avoid code duplication at all costs because uh, duplicated code forces you to do parallel changes. You have to change things in many, many places in the software at the same time. And if you forget one of those, uh, you have a bug or there is a problem. So instead, we, we do not want duplication. And you can remember uh, the DRY principle, the DRY acronym for this, which stands for don't repeat yourself. And the things have to be defined, must be defined once and only once in the project in order to be uh, efficient in the work. So this has been the sought after uh, principle in software development over the past few years. And in that regard, there have been many enhancements of progress. For example, libraries, uh, frameworks, tools, design patterns. And those are great, and it's actually a good idea to have those in mind. But on top of that, we can say we have a so-called extra tool when it comes to Python, which are decorators. I will not explain uh, all the details about decorators because it's uh, to extend the topic and it's worth a talk on itself. But I will only mention what's relevant for the purpose of this uh, talk, which is addressing code duplication. The, the general idea is that you can have some functionality abstracted in one place but repeated or reused many, many times. Let's see, with, uh, let's see this with an example. So let's say I have a maintenance database uh, task that is part of a framework called like this. And the high level idea is that uh, it is made of out of uh, a sequence of commands, and these are going to be executed. So the first task is to update the index of a database in Postgres. So I have a sequence which is uh, of one command, and the logic follows like this. Uh, I execute every command in the sequence with the cursor which is provided. If there is an error or something went wrong, I log the exception and return minus one. Otherwise, I log that, uh, that work fine and return zero. So far, so good. Let's assume that these are the valid codes that the framework requires, but then another requirement uh, arises and says that I need to move some data to, uh, from some records from a table to an archive table to only leave um, the most recent uh, rows in a table. So I say, okay, I can do that in two commands, two SQL statements, one for inserting the rows into the archive table, and then a second one for deleting the affected rows from the main table. But then, as part of the, fr the framework and the logic, I have to preserve the exact same logic. So I can do something like, okay, for every command in the sequence, I execute it with a cursor which is provided. If an exception occurs, I log the exception and return minus one. Otherwise, I log that it works fine and return zero. Uh, this actually also works, but now we see the problem. Uh, the problem is that uh, I have to preserve the logic, but uh, this is exactly the same code as before. The, starting from the try uh, except block is the exact same lines as before. And the reason why that might happen is because those lines that were uh, in charge of doing the error handling and logging didn't have a proper abstraction, location, or name for it. So it's similar, it's kind of similar to the very first example with the Libier. There was some code that didn't have a name, didn't have an abstraction, so it was actually uh, very error prone to duplicate the code. Let's see if we can address that uh, with a decorator. So the idea is that I create a new function, which I'm going to call the status handler, which is going to be a decorator. So it assumes it receives the function, which is the one that is going to be decorator. 
and inside it defines a new function, and there I can put the logic for doing the error handling. I execute every command in the sequence. Again, if an exception occurs, I lock the exception and return minus one. Otherwise, I lock that, that task completed well and return zero. This assumes that the function that's being decorated provides the sequence of commands. So there's an interesting thing here. Uh, first, we have a name for that. It's no longer an anonymous code. Now, now it's called DB status handler. And it's in charge of one thing, which is the error handling and executing the commands. So now the previous two functions can be changed to use um, the decorator. So I can remove all that duplicated logic and instead only return the sequence of commands, which is the relevant part. But they're still preserving the same logic because they're being decorated by the DB status handler on top of the function definitions. So we actually did three things with this change. First, we assigned a name to the previous anonymous call, which now is called DB status handler. Now there is a separation of concerns of the logic. Remember that the decorator now only handles the commands and the logging and knows nothing about the commands itself, whereas this uh, function have the opposite behavior. This uh, function only returns the sequence of relevant commands and no know nothing about their error handling. And last, a third, we remove the duplicated code and we have it defined only once. So this was a cool uh, way to use um, decorators to, um, to address duplication. So this is somehow related to another topic, which is uh, managing implementation details. The idea is that you have to run like a task as part of your core functionality, but you also have to do some other things that are related from technology you cannot avoid, you cannot escape from. And the idea is similar to the one before. We do not want to mix up or uh, uh, yeah, different things into the same problem. We still want uh, the same logic uh, separated into smaller pieces. So let's see what Python has to offer for each scenario. Let's consider a very for a simple example. Let's say you have a, a web application, an online game, um, with players like playing online. And I have a requirement that says that when a player finishes a game, I need to update the score with the new points that player has just earned for the match it just finished. So the idea is that giving a player status object, I call the accumulate points for the new points that I have to set for that player. And you might think this works, but if you take a closer look, you'll think that in, indeed this is uh, it's not very good because it's mixing up implementation details with business logic. All I wanted to do is to add new points for a given player, but instead I'm having to deal with a race connection uh, with a key zero, which seems to, be, seems to be a default value. An integer then follows what I actually want to do, which is to add a new score for the player. And then again, uh, another implementation details, another technical detail uh, with the set value. So instead, I what I would like to have is not the previous accumulate points uh, method, but instead just point, like if it were any other regular Python variable, because it's easier to follow and understand. So if I want to get the points of a player at any given time, I really, uh, just type points, the same for the set. So the previous accumulate points, there's nothing particular about it. It's just plus equal 20 on any, on any number, um, as I do with any other regular Python variable or attribute. So in order to achieve that, we can use the property decorator, which is a built-in decorator in Python. And the idea is that you define points to be a method of the class and there we can move and encapsulate and abstract the implementation details. So from whoever is calling it doesn't know what's behind it, and that's a good thing to have. It only knows about the points, and we have uh, two methods or two properties that are smaller in, in size and easier to un understand. So you can use the property decorator to use some computations based on our object attributes, and you should prefer this approach uh, instead of writing like custom getters and setter methods, because the code will be easier to read, to follow, and also to test. Because now you can test your code with anything that, that has uh, like a points attribute. You don't have to have uh, like a Redis connection for running your test, or mock the connection, or patch it, etc. So it's easier to understand and follow. It's much more Pythonic. Now let's suppose I have like a, a web application in this case that is an online store that has stock representing all the products that are in the, in the store. So they are dividing categories, and I may have a view like this one that says like request product for customer that is going to handle the scenario when some customer is trying to make a purchase of a product online. 
And if you care about code quality, you will find that like, this is a bit hard to read. In particular, these lines are not very expressive, but you still go to the trouble to read those lines, and you find a clue near the if statement when it says uh, if product available in stock. So you say, OK, maybe the previous line were actually trying to figure out that. Again, I'm guessing over anonymous code. So you say, if I want to figure out if a product is available in stock, I might rather just simply write that, like if product in current stock. What actually makes perfect sense is speaking in terms of the domain problem and is self-documenting. It doesn't need a comment. It doesn't need an explanation. And the way this works is because whenever you write something like that, if product in current stock, Python silently translates that by calling the contains method, the so-called magic method because of the double underscore, and passes the product as a parameter. So the idea is like, OK, now I know that. I can implement the contains method into the stock class and have an interface like the one I had before. It actually also makes sense. So the search algorithm can be encapsulated away in the class uh, that actually makes sense to me. Uh, another case for managing the state or handling uh, scenario is when we have a code that, again, runs a fun uh, core functionality in your project, but you also require to do certain tasks. Uh, for example, you might have a code that has preconditions or post conditions or both. Uh, for example, you're connecting to a server. You want to make sure after processing the data you need, uh, it's actually making sure that it's closing the connection or releasing the resources uh, it allocates. So the, the problem is here that we might, uh, again, fear the risk of actually trying to mix up those things. And instead, they should be together uh, separated into different layers. So let's see if we can do that uh, with a context manager, which the idea is uh, very simple. Let's say I have, a, I have to run an offline database backup. So my backup requires that uh, the database services stop before running, then run the, the offline backup. And then, of course, I want to make sure I'm leaving the database service up and running again. So instead of trying to put this, the stop database service and start database service inside the run offline backup, which doesn't belong to and is making the, the code more, more coupled or more yeah, accomplished, uh, instead we can separate that into a handler, which is going to be called with a context manager like this. So when I write like with, and an object that implement the context manager protocol, Python silently translates that and calls the enter method automatically, which in this case will stop the database service, then follows the wait statement, the block, and then I can run the core functionality where I actually want to do, which in this case is running the backup. And then after the last statement completes, uh, it automatically calls the exit method, even if an exception occurred. So it's making things easier because I don't have to do the error handling myself or manage edge cases or scenarios. I will make sure that even if this fails or if something went wrong, the database service uh, will be uh, left up and running no matter what. You can slightly improve this by using the context decorator, which is uh, an interface provided in the context lib. And once you inherit and extend that interface, you implement the enter and exit methods. And once you have that, you can use that as a decorator for the function. So whenever, in this case, if I call it like this, whenever I'm calling DB status handler, this is going to be called automatically inside the context manager, uh, calling the e enter and exit methods. So from all of these, we can draw the conclusion that there's always a much more Pythonic way to write things. And the best way to write Pythonic code is to actually take advantage of the features of the language. I would clue that you're achieving so if, if your variables or your objects are playing well with Python reserve variables, uh, like two pieces of a sheet that match together, so in a way that makes sense, like the example of a stock. And sometimes in order to achieve that, the, the most common answer is a magic method. But now that there are many other tools, many other magic methods or features of the language, such, such as uh, descriptors, uh, etc. So if you're starting, uh, you're a beginner in Python, I really encourage you to try to find this choice in Python in order to transform your code into a much expressive one. And if you're an experienced developer, you might use, all, use these examples as uh, ideas in order to provide feedback in a code review or in a pull request. Try to see if the code is Python. So to wrap up, we can say that the best way to write Pythonic code is to actually take advantage of the language, uh, of the feature languages. Sometimes that means uh, using a uh, decorator, uh, removing duplication, uh, using a context manager, etc. Uh, aside to that, you also have some standards that can help you write better code and can be understood by the team. 
uh, for example, Pepeit on other coding guidelines. But now that you can be 100% with them, I still not have Python code because they're actually looking for different things. Although it's a good idea to keep them in mind. Uh, try to put doc strings or functional annotations you want to give your readers about what you expect at any function in the code. And everything that applies here for the so-called productive code also applies for unit tests. You should also maintain your unit test um, clean and with good structure so they are useful. And also, it's a good idea to use uh, test and TDD because you will naturally follow this logic or actually trying to define smaller pieces because you will want to make your code testable. Um, and in addition to that, we have finally some tools that we can use to provide metrics for the code. We have like PyCode style, PyLint, and Radon. You can run this in your project and it will give you metrics such as psychomatic complexity, maintainability index, etc., cetera, uh, that you can use as a head start to know where the code needs more improvements urgently. And finally, Koala, which works with the previous tool, but also lets you define your own standards to be run or check automatically as part of your continuous integration environment. Uh, if you're particularly interested in some of the topics, you can have more information in some of these uh, sources that I use as support for the talk. Uh, that will be all, and if you have any questions, I will have the answer. Thank you very much. I think we have time for questions. Right? We have time for a couple of questions. Any, anyone? No questions? So thanks to the speaker again. Okay.